good to be in the house of the Lord. Come on, somebody, stand on your feet tonight. Amen. Are you, did you come expecting tonight? I know you did. Amen. It's going to be a great night. The presence of the Lord is here. Amen. Welcome, everybody, online. Thanks for joining us tonight. We pray that the same anointing, the same spirit that's here reaches where you are tonight. Amen. Come on, let's lift our hands. Lord, we love you. We embrace your presence tonight. We embrace your move. Have your way with us tonight, Lord. Everything that's said and done is for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on.
Proclaim this over your family and friends. I cry freedom from the chains that bind your children. Freedom from the chains that bind our praise to you. Freedom from the lies of the enemy. Freedom. Come on, can you sing that with me? Come on, let's do some warfare tonight. Come on. The mind your children. Free them from the chains. The mind our praise to you. Free them from the lies. Love. One scripture, excuse me. Clap your hands. There's only one. But there are several that says, shout unto God with a voice of triumph. We're real good at this, but we're not real good at that. I love love what Larry said. Brother Larry, uh, he he mentioned that uh, we love to sing about dancing, but we won't do it. Can we break off the religion tonight and just get free in the Lord? You didn't drive all this way to Bethesda tonight just to sit there and get entertained because that's not what we're here to do. We're here to go for the throne room of an almighty God. And there is power in the multitude of praise. Amen. Let's get free tonight. Can we do that? One, two, three, four. I want to praise you a little longer than before. I want to lift my hands higher than before. I want to shout a little louder than before. I want to shout a little louder than before. Deeper than 
trying to steal my voice tonight, but we're not going to have it. Allergies are gone in the name of Jesus. Whatever it is, it's under the anointing. Amen. Come on.
Come to your house tonight, Lord. What are you thankful for tonight, church? Just tell them. Just tell them. A heart of gratitude opens doors. A heart of thankfulness opens doors. I believe the key into his presence is saying, Lord, I thank you. A heart of thanksgiving. A heart of gratitude. Oh, and nothing without you, Lord. But through you we can do all things for your glory, Jesus. For your glory, Jesus. We want you. We want you. We need you. We want you. We need you. Travis Jeff Coat on just a few days ago received his promotion into the presence of God. We're going to miss Travis, but we're thankful he loved the Lord. And in this moment, he is in the presence of an almighty God. His body is whole. 
his mind is whole. I can only imagine, Travis, what you're seeing right now. His memorial service will be 1 o'clock on Friday at John Ireland Funeral Home. And if you can be there, the family would love your attendance. How many of you got a, a sheet tonight of all the prayer requests, all the needs, amen? I want you to take this home. And if you ever have a, a few moments where you're like, I just don't know what to pray about, guess what? You got plenty of needs, amen? I'm going to mention the names that are on this list. My dad, Arlie Branson. Brother Kerry McClure doing much better. Shirley Robinette need to touch. Marcy Royal need to touch. Miss Karen Adams had surgery, recovering. Nadine Catlett needs to touch. Lola Collins, love you, sister. Claudia McAllister, Doyle McAllister, Bill Tomlin, Delane Pinner, Stephanie Richards, Patty Ross, and I know there's more, but God's able, amen, and he's faithful. If you have a need tonight, can you lift your hand to the Lord? Amen. We surrender to him tonight. We don't hold it. We say, Lord, you know what? I'm a child of a king, and when I've got an issue, guess what? It's his issue too. Amen. If I've got a problem, it's his problem too. If I have a need, guess what? It's his need. Right? You, you see what I'm saying? You're grafted in the vine if he's your Lord and Savior. Amen. He loves you. He cares for you. Lord, we love you tonight. You see the hands in this place. Those online that have a prayer request. God, I pray you be their portion tonight. You love us so much. Not a sparrow falls from heaven that you don't know about it. And so how much more important are we? Hallelujah, Jesus. All these needs that are on this paper, God, we thank you for their lives. We thank you for their testimonies. We thank you for their, their witness, God. But, Lord, I believe on this list, Father, you're going to receive the glory for the needs that are met, for the miracles that take place and for the lives that are changed. And once again, every hand that was raised here tonight, I just pray, Lord, you give peace that passes all understanding. You give strength where strength is needed. You give provision where there's lack. But Lord, most of all, this last couple months that we've been diving deeper into your Holy Spirit and your presence, may that power and that strength just come up and overwhelm us tonight. May it overfill us tonight so we can spill it and get refilled some more, Lord. We're so thankful you brought the Martins to us, God. And can't wait to see what you have in store tonight. But, Lord, we open our hearts to you. We say, use us, God. The worship came and it plowed the ground. And the seeds that are about to go in that ground, Father, may they not go dormant. But may we take full measure of it tonight. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Thank you, worship team. I love you guys. Give them a hand real quick, amen. Thank you, Lord. As you're being seated, look at your neighbor and say, I'm sure glad you're here tonight. Amen. Praise the Lord. I love it when people get filled with the Holy Spirit on Wednesday nights. <laughs> it's like, take that, devil. You know, here at Bethesda, we don't believe in just having a Wednesday night service just to say we have one. You know, this service is just as important as a Sunday morning at 10 a.m. Because my God's capable to do anything at any time. Sunday morning, Sunday night at camp, I don't, in your car, amen. Just don't keep your eyes shut too long in the car. But, man, I'm going to turn it right over because I don't want to waste any time getting right into this. Haven't the Martins been a blessing, amen. We're so glad you're here. So glad you're here. Come on, give Brother Larry a big hand as he comes. Dr. Larry Martin. Love you, buddy. Hallelujah. Isn't it wonderful to be in the presence of the Lord? You, you just don't know. I know I said this before, but you just don't know how blessed you are here to have this worship team that brings you into the presence of the Lord. Top notch, top quality, and yet so anointed by the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's good to see you tonight. Have you had a good week so far? You made it to hump day. <laughs> Amen. It is good to see some friends here tonight. 
Pastor Lonnie Harris. Said he'd heard me preach before. I said it didn't hurt you, did it? <laughs> Probably hurt him a little bit, but he survived. He is a survivor. It's good to see Margie Rury here tonight. Margie Dietrich to me. Her mother was in our church in Comanche where I grew up. The first sermon I preached, I was 15 years old and it was horrible. <laughs> I preached for about 10, 12 minutes. I told everybody they were going to hell and amen, that was about it. <laughs> And I'm serious, it was pretty, ser it was pretty seriously bad. And uh, Sister Dietrich was an adult ladies Sunday school teacher in our church and just a woman of God. And I'd go over to her house and, and uh, we'd pray together. She had some uh, metal lawn chairs out in her yard and the, we'd sit out there and talk and pray. And Sister Dietrich told me, she said, now, Larry, when you preach, if you're gonna preach about faith, tell the story about somebody in the Bible that had faith. And if you want to preach about faithfulness, preach about somebody in the Bible that had faithfulness. Tell their story. And I started telling stories 50 years ago. And I've been to, I don't know, 11 different schools. I have six earned degrees and I learned more from Sister Dietrich's backyard than I learned in all of those schools combined. That's the truth. I'm not making that up. In that school of the spirit in her backyard. Thank you for coming tonight. Hallelujah. Do you feel what I feel tonight? Do you feel this presence of the Lord? Would it be all right just to acknowledge him again? Would you just lift your hands and He's worthy of all the praise we can give him. Ooh, come on, come on. Can you get a little louder? Can you shout a little louder than before? Can you raise a hallelujah in this house? Can you... Ooh, he's worthy. Come on, church. He's worthy. He's worthy of more than just 30 seconds of our best. Come on. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to God. Lord, we bless your holy name. Bless your holy name. Who? Bless your holy name. I was in a church starting a revival, it's been a number of years ago, and we started on a Saturday night. Don't ever start a revival on Saturday night. We started a revival on Saturday night and it was dry, man, oh man, it was dry. And I preached like with a mouthful of cotton, it was so dry. And, and I called people at the end of the service for an altar call and nobody responded and Back in those days, in the revival days, we prayed for everybody that would come to church. Some, some of them would get in line three times to get prayed for. And I said, anybody that wants more of God, just come on down and I'll pray for you. I think two people came down out of that crowd that wanted prayer. It was so rough. And then we were there again the next morning, Sunday, and it was still dry. I was hoping it'd get better on Sunday. It was still dry. And Sunday night, it was drier than shucks and Monday and Tuesday, and I, I'm, just, I'm just counting the days until I get to go home. You know what I'm saying? It's, I'm done there. They, they, don't want, they don't want what I'm selling. I'm, I'm, Wednesday night, I got up, and I just felt led of the Lord to tell a story out of the Welsh, uh, excuse me, not the Welsh revival, but the Hebrides revivals. And in that story, they were praying they had had great revivals in the Hebrides, if you've ever studied about it in the 40s and 50s, and they were in a city and they were not having the breakthrough that they had hoped for, and so they had called a prayer meeting and they were all praying for a revival to break out and they were Presbyterians, and they were praying one at a time and it came elders tiring to pray and he started praying and he prayed like this. He said, now Lord, I don't know the hearts of all these people 
I don't know the hearts even of these preachers that are here, but I know my heart. And he said, I know my heart is right with you. And you promised in your word that you'd pour water on the thirsty and floods on dry ground. And you said, Lord, if we were hungry and thirsty that you'd fill us. And you haven't done that for us. Now, you'll, some of you will be shocked by this prayer, but he said, now, Lord, if you don't do that, how can I ever trust you again? If you don't do what you said you would do, how could I ever believe you again? And when he said that, they were in a slate rock house and the house started shaking. The rocks in the house started shaking. Dishes shook off the cabinet onto the floor. And at the same moment, across that town, people were awakened from their sleep and got out of their bed and fell on their knees on their bed bedside crying out to God for salvation and repentance and God sent a mighty revival. That's a true story. I didn't make that up. That's a true story. And I told that story that Wednesday night in that dead dry church and there was an elder lady sitting in the very middle. They had three sections and she was sitting in the very middle of the middle section. I will never forget it. And unembarrassed, unintimidated, she cried out. She didn't whisper, she cried out and she said, oh God, if you could do that for them, can't you do something for us? And when she said that, it was like you took a knife and cut through the heavens above and the sky split open and the glory of God fell in that church We sang and shouted. We had Jericho marches that night. The glory of God came down and revival broke out because one person, are you that one? One person got desperate enough to cry out to God for revival and revival came. God, let us cry out. Our nation is going to hell in a handbasket. If we don't have revival, we are sunk. We have nothing left in this place to leave our children if we don't have revival. Let somebody be the one that cries out to God. That's not what I'm even talking about tonight, but (laughs) it was all right. You know about our websites and Pentecostal gold. I put a sermon up there today by E.R. Anderson used to be the North Texas District Superintendent of the Assemblies of God a great powerful Pentecostal message I put up there today I'm going to put some messages of Lonnie Harris up there when they get into my hands he he gave them to my pastor and my pastor's hoarded them somewhere and I I haven't seen them Brother Harris but I know I know they're out there somewhere praise the Lord and uh, our other websites you can look at those Uh, Someone asked me Sunday, in fact, Brother Brown's sister, I don't know if she's here tonight, but she asked me Sunday if any of the books I had had any stories about Brother Brown, and this little book does. It tells a story of when I was a teenager and Brother Brown was cleaning the floors in the church and something that changed my life, and that's in this little book right here. Would you give this to her Sunday, please? I told her I'd save her one. That's the first book I ever wrote, and they're almost... I don't have hardly a, I know I don't have a box of them left, but this is what I'm talking about tonight. William J. Seymour and the Azusa Street Revival. It's out there on the table and that's that's enough of that. Let's get started. We want to, I want to, I want to begin tonight to tell you the Azusa Street story. To be continued. Don't you hate it when you're watching a Blue Bloods and they get in the worst possible predicament and they say, stay tuned next time. <laughs> and they hang you until the next season starts, you know. Who shot JR? <laughs> I don't know where that came from. I hadn't said that in 40 years, but <laughs> who shot JR? Anyway, tonight, last week we talked about the revival in Topeka, Kansas that started the Pentecostal movement. And we talked about how it spread through Kansas and Oklahoma, Missouri, went down into Houston and out into Zion, Illinois. And then it went to California. That's where we're going to start tonight. And I'm going to talk tonight basically about William J. Seymour, the pastor of that mission. If I get through, 
in a decent time, we'll take some questions tonight and just we'll see how that develops if you have any questions about the early Pentecostal revival. Uh, if you've got questions about who's the Antichrist, Brother Michael will answer those for you afterwards. I'm just talking about, I'm just doing Pentecostal history. But uh, uh, I'd like to pray for you tonight. I sense there's an anointing in the house tonight. I said I sense there's an anointing in the house tonight. There is something about revival that it is contagious. It's contagious. You get around it, you catch it. If I've got a cold and I sneeze on you, tomorrow you're sneezing, okay? If you get exposed to revival, if you listen to stories about revival and read about revival, you'll catch it. And I feel that anointing here tonight. Praise the Lord. I went blank up there, up here. Oh. I'm going to tell you about William J. Seymour. I'm, if, oh, they got it back up there. Wonderful. I need to, this is my outline when I look at these pictures. But I told you last week, God doesn't use churches or denominations or institutions. He only uses people. And in this case, he used one of the most unlikely vessels that could ever be used in a powerful way by God. But he used this man in a powerful way. He, he, is, he is recognized in church history as one of the greatest leaders in the Christian church. At the end of the, the last millennium, as we come into the 2000 there, the, the National Press Association marked the Azusa Street Revival as one of the top events of the past millennium. Uh, Christian History Magazine said William Seymour was one of the 10 most influential Christians of the 20th century. That's pretty significant. I want to tell you about this fellow tonight. He was born in Centerville, Louisiana. I don't know if you all know where Centerville is. It's a little town south of Franklin, between Franklin and Morgan City, if you go down that way. and uh, it, the I took that picture some years ago, and you can see the background Growing in the background, there's rice, and it was a, it's a rice area. And uh, so uh, he was born on a rice plantation. This isn't the place he was born, but it was like this. You, you can see uh, African Americans out there working the field, and uh, they were, I said rice. What, what am I saying? Sugar, a sugar plantation. I was thinking Louisiana, and I got stuck on rice. It was a sugar plantation, and uh, they're, they're burning, as you can see, the chaff back there and uh, processing sugar. He was born on a sugar plantation. The plantation he was born on was owned by a guy named Adelard Carlin. Once again, I apologize for telling you more than you want to know, but uh, I'm going to give you a good history tonight. Adelard Carlin had come to the United States and uh, had received a land grant Many of his family came from the United States and, um, excuse me, came from Europe to settle in the United States and they owned thousands and thousands of acres, big plantations in Louisiana. He, he was one of those. This is, a, this is a plot of the land that he owned and uh, it was just outside of Centerville and he owned the plantation and, of course, this was pre-Civil War and the plantation was worked by slaves I know that America has some dark times in our history and the way Native Americans were treated is, is a horrible story. But I don't think there's anything that compares to the awful, peculiar institution of slavery when that one person could own another person. One, one person could own another person as chattel property. These, these are from the newspaper right there outside of Centerville on Franklin, Louisiana. And you can see on the newspaper articles, legal sale, secession sale, legal sale, sheriff sale. Legal. All of these are sales, but they're not just sales for, for land or sales for cattle. These are sales for slaves. These are sales for human beings. I didn't tell you I should. Both of Seymour's parents were born into slavery. His mother was born a slave on the Adelard Carline Plantation. They were both slaves. 
Uh, this just kind of says it all to me. For sale, the Negro woman Elijah, a good field hand and age 35 years for terms apply to A. Gates. Can you, can you imagine an advertisement to sell a human being? This is the census that was taken in 1860. And if you look at the very top finger pointing, that's Adelard Carlin's name. You can see it there, Adelard Carlin. If you go down further and see the other finger, it's pointing at William Seymour's mother. Her name was Phyllis Salabar. But you don't see her name on the enumeration of the census because they did not count African Americans as human. They didn't count them as people. They counted them as property. William Seymour's mother was between 15 and 20 years of age. And on the census, you can see if you were close enough, I can see it from here, there were four female slaves between the age of 15 and 20. And in that period of time, William Seymour's mother fit into that category. She was one of those slaves listed there on that census. Well, we know that the Civil War broke out uh, primarily over slavery. They, some people want to say states' rights, but the bottom line was it was the institution of slavery. And when the Civil War broke out, we know that, of course, the, the South was fighting against the North. This is a, a piece of money, a 25-cent piece of money, paper money, well, Confederate money. It really wasn't worth anything. But you'll notice at the bottom, it was printed in Centerville. It was printed in William Seymour's hometown. And then came the Emancipation Proclamation. Who can tell me, I know you don't have to be a historian to know this, who can tell me, what was the Emancipation Proclamation? You're scared to say anything. What? It freed the slaves. How many of y'all believe that? It didn't really. Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation after the Civil War had started and the North had separated from the South and the Emancipation Proclamation freed the slaves in the South. Abraham Lincoln, the President of the United States, freed the, sa the slaves in the Confederate States of America. Really, the Emancipation Proclamation didn't literally free anybody. It was just a declaration that Lincoln made. In fact, a lot of people think it was unconstitutional at the time. But he made a declaration that the slaves would be freed. And that's what that did. And when they signed that and the slaves were quote unquote free, they were free in the south in areas where the north had conquered. I know that there's people in the south that still think that they won the war. They didn't win the war, not even close. Very early in the war, the north took the area around New Orleans and came up and held that territory around Centerville. So, so William Seymour's parents were freed when they signed the Emancipation Proclamation because they were in that area that was under the control of the Northern Army. And they began to conscript former slaves into the Union Army. They called them the United States Colored Troops. And William Seymour's father was one of the first African Americans to ever serve in the United States Army. He, he uh, signed up for the Army. He, he joined the Army. This is his, his record for the Army. You see his name is Simon Seymour, and he was dark complected, black eyes and black hair. Uh, he was uh, five foot five inches tall, and that's William Seymour's dad right there. That's his, his time in the Army. He, while he was there in the, in the army, he fought across Louisiana and Alabama and Mississippi down into Florida. They had a few skirmishes. They didn't really have any big battles that they fought, but he got very sick. We don't know what was wrong with him. Uh, if you study his symptoms, it seems like he probably had malaria, and that makes sense walking through those swamps down in there. But he was very, very sick, and he came back from the service of the army very ill, and, and his, his family requested that the government give him a, a, a money because of his illness, that he was sick and he needed, he needed money, he couldn't work, and so this is a, 
odd story, but he went to New Orleans and he went to a doctor and the doctor examined him and the doctor sent a report to the war department and said there was nothing wrong with him. And so they wrote a letter from the war department to his family telling them that there was nothing wrong with him, but before the letter arrived, he died. I guess he died of nothing because there was nothing wrong with him, but uh, he was very ill and he died. And when he died, he had, I kind of getting part of the story ahead of it, but when he died, he had a, a, a house full of kids and one of them was William Seymour. And this is uh, where William Seymour was born. Nobody else has seen this but y'all, I'm gonna tell y'all. I might have showed this once or twice in a church, but, but nobody knows where William Seymour was born, but I found the place. And that was the slave quarters on Adelard Carlin's plantation. And more than likely, Seymour was born there. Was, uh, the Civil War had ended, and he had uh, six, seven siblings, and they were all born there in that house. And, and when he was born, his parents took him over to Franklin, Louisiana, and had him baptized at the Catholic Church. Now, you talk about an eclectic faith. William Seymour's parents were married by a Methodist preacher. They took all of their kids to the Catholic Church and had them baptized. And when they died, they buried them in a Baptist cemetery. So I'm, I'm, just, not, I'm just not exactly sure what they were, but uh, uh, they, were, they, were, they were quite eclectic. I, I'll never forget the day, and, and I'm watching the clock a little bit, but I'll never forget the day I was in the library at Centerville studying for this, this book, working on this book, and a guy said to me, have you read, the, have you studied the Catholic books? And told me the, the priest's name. Said he's, he's, he has written all of the, the histories of the Catholic churches and the parishes and everybody that was baptized and died. And I said, no, these people weren't Catholic. They were, they were slaves and they wouldn't have been Catholic. And he said, well, you ought to look. So I got that book at the library and I looked and there I found where William Seymour had been born and had been baptized in this church right here. And I said, wow, where is this church? And he said, well, it's across the street. I walked across the street and I asked the priest or the secretary, I said, do you have baptismal records from 1870? Oh, yes, sir. I said, well, I want a baptismal record for William Seymour and all of his brothers and sisters. And she said, okay, and it cost you $5 a piece. And I said, that uh, gladly. And, and she starts working and then she starts printing out these fancy baptismal certificates. And I said, no, no, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm looking for the original record. And she went back in the vault and pulled out the old record book. And there it is, the baptism of William Seymour. You can see there a little bit different. It says William Simon. Do you see that? William Simon. And it says that his father's name was Simon Simon. And his mother's name was Felicia, was Phyllis Salabar. I knew that was... Seymour's mom and dad, but their name is Simon. And I began to put two and two together. They lived in South Louisiana and, and the people there speak French. The newspaper was printed half English and half French. And Simon in French is Simon. And these people, former slaves could not read or write and they didn't know their name. At, some places, you can study the same things I have in the war department everywhere else. Sometimes his name is Simon Simon and sometimes his name is Simon Seymour or it's Simon Simon or Simon Seymour. They finally settled when, the, when the, like William came along, they finally settled on the name Seymour and, and uh, that's, the, that's the name that stuck. But uh, Simon Simon and uh, then uh, his dad died and he was raised in abject poverty. Now, this isn't a picture of William Seymour. They didn't have money for a picture. But this is how he was raised. This is the kind of house he was raised in. He was raised in a log cabin. They didn't have any, out, any kitchen. They, they cooked outside on an open fire. They did an affidavit. This, this I want you all to pay particular attention. They did an affidavit for the government of all their property. They, they were asking for a pension. And they did an, an assessment of all their property and put it in an affidavit. And everything the family owned was worth 65 cents. Everything the family owned was worth 65 cents. They had one chair and a table and one bed and one mattress and that old cabin and everything they owned. People today think they're poor. 
they were poor. That's the way this man, get a hold of this. That's the way this man changed the world, was raised. That's the way a man that's a, one of the most significant men in church history was raised in a house and property worth 65 cents, but that's only half the story. This is Centerville. This is when Seymour was 10 years old. This was published when he was 10 years old. And you see there in the street, there's cannons in the street. The army, the Northern Army was still occupying South Louisiana 10 years after the Civil War because there was so much violence going on in that part of the world. It was terrible. And these are pictures of freedmen, former slaves, and they're in the swamps in Louisiana and they're hiding. You know why they're hiding? Because they were being hunted down like animals and killed. They were killing them like they were deer or rabbit. They hunted them down in the swamps and murdered them. They're hiding from white people. This was the year Seymour was born. This was published. And as you look at this, that little baby there, that could have very well been Seymour and his mom and dad. Look over their head. It says, worse than slavery. On one side, there's the KKK, and on the other side, the White League. There was a group in Franklin, Louisiana called the Knights of the White Camellia, and they wore white hoods and white robes, and they terrorized African Americans. It was a horrible, horrible time for African Americans in the South. There's, here's the story of this man. He's raised in poverty, and he's raised in an atmosphere of hatred, and fear like you can't even imagine. We, we don't even understand today. I know we've got racial difficulties in America today. But it doesn't even compare to what it was in 1870 in, in Louisiana. He went to a freedman's school, learned to read and write. In fact, he had a, 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 a pretty distinguished penmanship. That's where he signed his name. I know this doesn't interest anybody but me, but I was at Springfield the other day at the archives up there and somebody had donated a book to the archives in Springfield. It was a book by Amy Simple McPherson and, and, and Seymour's name was in the front page of it. He had owned that book at some time in the history of that book and had underlined some things in there about African Americans. I was glad to see it. Well, as soon as Seymour could, he left Louisiana You can understand why. And he went up north. He followed kind of what had been the Underground Railroad. And he went up north and he got a job as a waiter in a hotel. He worked in Chicago and he worked in Indianapolis. He actually waited tables in that hotel in Indianapolis. He he actually served in that cafe as a waiter in Indianapolis, Indiana. But more important, he went to a Methodist church in Indianapolis and heard the gospel preached and gave his life to Christ, surrendered himself to the Lord. Now, I said, I don't know what his parents were, but I know what William Seymour was. He was born again. He got saved at the Methodist Church in Indianapolis. He went from there to Cincinnati. While he was in Cincinnati working, doing the same thing, waiter work, while he was there, a a bout of smallpox broke out across the river in Kentucky and smallpox was deadly in those days. And William Seymour contracted smallpox. If you, if you see his picture, you see that he always wore a beard, and that's because he had scars from smallpox on his face. So he grew a beard, and one of the pox was on his eye. You can see there in the picture his, his, his right eye. Uh, uh, one of the smallpox, pox as they call them, was on his eye and blinded him. He was blind in one eye. Now, I gotta say this. If you don't think God has a sense of humor, he uses a one-eyed man named Seymour. (laughs) Where's the drummer? (laughs) But this is important as I tell you the story because he's not only raised in poverty, in an atmosphere of hate, but he's handicapped. He's got all of these things working against him, but he's still used of God. I want to say, when I read his story, what's your excuse? What's my excuse for not being used of God? 
If he could be used of God under all those circumstances, you see, God's not looking for people with great ability. He's looking for people with great availability and accessibility. He's looking for you. You're looking over your shoulder and wondering when God's gonna use the person behind you, in front of you, or beside you, but God wants to use you. Amen. He used William Seymour. He can use you. Oh, man, I could preach. Well, in his travels, oh, I forgot to tell you, while he had smallpox, he had felt like God had called him to preach, and while he had smallpox, he asked God if he would heal him, not let him die, that he would surrender to preach the gospel. Kind of a Jonah story. And uh, out of the belly of the whale, he cried out to God and he surrendered to preach the gospel. And he started preaching and he left the north. He went from Cincinnati, I think, up to Cleveland. He went down to Jackson, Mississippi. And he ends up in Houston. And uh, he's in Houston, Texas. He's preaching in a little holiness church in Houston, Texas that was pastored by a lady named Lucifer. And uh, he met Charles Parham from last week. Charles Parham had had that great revival in Topeka, Kansas. Now he's moved down to Houston and he's opened a Bible school in Houston. And William Seymour is hungry for more of God. Everybody say hungry. The Bible says if you hunger and thirst, you'll be filled. He was hungry for God, so he went to this Bible school. It was like 12 weeks long. They studied uh, the apostolic faith teachings and the baptism of the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues. There's different stories. If you've read his story, there's different stories about how that he wasn't allowed in the school. He had to set out in the hallway because of the Jim Crow laws at that time. That may only be half true. I, I can't tell you that's completely true because a number of eyewitnesses talk about him being in the classroom with the other students. I just know he just wasn't treated quite the same as everyone else. And William Seymour and Charles Parham preached together. Now, you've got to understand, back in that day, when they preached together, that means that, that William Seymour only preached to black people. In Texas, in that day, if you mixed a crowd, you not only could go to jail, but you could be killed for it. F.F. Bosworth was almost beat to death because they accused him of doing that. And so he went to this Bible school. A lady from California came to Houston and she, her name was Neely Terry. And she heard William Seymour preach. And she said, we need to get that man to preach in our church in California. So when she went back to California, she says to her pastor, Julia Hutchinson, we need to invite this man I heard in Houston to come and preach for us. And they did. And they put together some money for him for train fare. And Parham gave him some money. And William Seymour headed to California. And I'm telling you, when he got to Los Angeles, it changed the Christian church forever. When he got to Los Angeles, it changed the world forever. Most of that, I'm going to wait and talk about next Wednesday night, but I want to finish this, this story because in, in California, there was an atmosphere of hunger for revival. Can you say that word again? Hunger. This guy was the pastor of the First Baptist Church in Los Angeles, Joseph Smale. He was an Englishman. He was so hungry for a move of God. At that time, there was a great revival going over in, on over in Wales, over there in Great Britain. And, and Joseph Smale took a sabbatical from his church and rode in a ship. Well, he went to the Holy Land, through the Holy Land, and up to Wales so that he could meet Evan Roberts. He wanted God. And when he met Evan Roberts, he said to him, what must we do to have revival in Los Angeles? And the young evangelist, the young Welsh revival evangelist, Evan Roberts said, if you want to have revival in Los Angeles, have service every day until God shows up. Isn't that a novel idea? We got churches today trying to see how little they can have church. Amen. Right. I saw a church in Waco, their sign says 30 minute church. I thought it can't be. I looked it up online. True, true. Their church is 30-minute church. They got it broken down. They have five minutes of worship and 12 minutes of preaching and three minutes of interaction. 30 minutes a week is all they can give God. No wonder we don't have revival. He said, have service every day till God shows up, and they did. In fact, they had service twice a day, 
And God was beginning to show up. There was a stirring. Some great people were coming through preaching and praying and and there was a stirring. Y'all listen, hang on to this. One of the deacons came to the pastor and said, you've got to close out this revival. Two things. He said, number one, it's too loud. (laughs) The most universal complaint about revival. It's too loud. And number two, he said, there's all these strange people that we don't know come into our church. We want it to be like it used to be. And they closed the door to revival at the First Baptist Church of Los Angeles. That's a true story. God could have used that church as the portal to bring revival. One deacon got in the way. This guy, Frank Bartleman, he was so hungry for God Everybody say that word again. He was so hungry for God. He was fasting and praying. He would pray all night long, over and over again. Fasted so much, he about destroyed his health. He wanted God to move. He he was writing Evan Roberts, and Evan Roberts was writing him back and telling him how to have revival. And Evan Roberts wrote some. I mean, there were some books published on the Welsh revival. I got some back there on my table. One called The Great Revival in Wales. And he was ordering those books and selling them and giving them out in Los Angeles and and printing tracts. They were hungry. They were hungry. But most hungry was this little place right here, 214 Bonnie Bray Street. Every night they had a prayer meeting in their home. The house was owned by Richard and Ruth Asbury, African-American couple. Richard was a janitor. Well, he was a custodian, okay? We'll We'll give him some. Ruth was a laundry woman. She took in people's laundry a lower, middle-class, African-American couple hungry for God. Every night they had prayer meetings in their house. It was 214. Los Angeles renumbered the streets. It's 216 now. It's still there. Well, when William Seymour came to Los Angeles, he came to that church where they'd invited him to preach, and as soon as he was there, he preached on the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, and they threw him out of the church. Don't be so hard on them right away because William Seymour had not received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. He had not received in Houston, so he came to Los Angeles preaching an experience that he had not personally received. They called together a big meeting of their Holiness Association, and they said to him, you come back when you've got it. We'll listen to you when you've got it. So they locked him out of the church. He didn't have anywhere to live. He's 1,000 miles, 1,500 miles from home. And he bunked up with a guy named Edward Lee. Edward Lee was also a janitor at a bank. And they joined these people at 216 Bonnie Bray Street praying for revival. Edward Lee was in the bank one day praying down in the basement. And he had a vision. And he saw the day of Pentecost. And he saw Peter and John when they received the Holy Ghost. He came home and said, I know what it's like to get the Holy Ghost because I saw Peter and John. You understand, all of us raised in the Pentecostal church have seen people speak in tongues all of our life. These people never saw that before. He said, the power of God came on Peter and John and they started shaking in the power of the Holy Ghost and they started speaking in tongues. I, I saw it. I know what it's like to get the Holy Ghost. Well, they called a fast. They're gonna fast for 10 days. How many of y'all ever been on a fast? The most misnamed word in the English language is fast because a fast is the slowest thing you'll ever do. A three-day fast can be a month long. I read a book once that said, if you fast long enough, you won't be hungry anymore. I want to set y'all straight. I have fasted for weeks at a time and there's never been a minute I fasted I wasn't hungry. I'm hungry right now just talking about fasting. The thought of fasting makes me hungry. Well, they called a 10-day fast and three days in, 
Edward Lee wasn't feeling well. And if you've ever gone on a long fast, you know the third day is a tough day. You get through the third day, you might make 10 or a week, third day. And he didn't feel well and he came home and he asked William Seymour to pray for him April the 9th, 1906. And William Seymour, who had never received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, laid his hands on Edward Lee's head and Edward Lee was baptized in the Holy Ghost and started speaking in other tongues. They got up and walked over to the Bonnie Bray Street house where the prayer meeting was already taking place and they asked Edward Lee to testify and when he started testifying, he started speaking in tongues and it was like a bomb exploded in the house. The glory of God came down at 214 Bonnie Bray Street. People were slain in the spirit. People were speaking in tongues. People were shouting and running through the house, scared the kids to death. <laughs> One woman Jeannie Evans Moore, she later became Seymour's wife. Jeannie Evans Moore lived across the street. She had never played the piano in her life, but she sat down at the piano and started playing the piano and singing under the anointing of the Holy Ghost because God gave her the talent to play the piano that she had never touched a key. Piano's still in that house out there. God came down. Oh, it was Awesome, they'd never seen anything like it. People began to come. The word got out. God is doing something. Remember what I told you? They were hungry. And when they heard that God was doing something, people started coming from all over the city. And they, if you ever go and see the house, it sets up on a hill and the people would come and William Seymour would stand on the porch and preach and they'd fill the street up like an amphitheater down there below them as they preached about Pentecost and, and so many people came that they could no longer deal with the crowds at the house and they started looking for a place to have church and they found this building, a little 40 by 60 building, an abandoned church turned into a warehouse at 312 Azusa Street. And within a week, they rented that building and they moved into that building and the glory of God came down and changed the world. In a little dilapidated shack of a building on a dirt street two blocks long in Los Angeles, California, God changed the whole world. From Azusa Street, the Pentecost revival literally spread to the world. Going to talk about that next week. Next week, I'm going to take us from Azusa Street to Chicago, introduce you to a man named William Durham, and tell you how Pentecost spread around the world. And when they tell you about the assemblies of God being formed and about the vision at the location where the assemblies of God headquarters are today, you'll be blessed. I mean, blessed by that story. But Mostly the first part of next week, I'll tell you about some of the miracles of things that happened at Azusa Street. I, I think you'll be blessed by it. But William Seymour passed away in 1922, 52 years old. He, he, he died of heart failure. The last words that he spoke were, I love my Jesus so. I love my Jesus so. A man raised in the poverty and hatred and handicapped in life and yet he served God so faithfully and he finished his journey so well to say I love my Jesus so. I don't know about you but when I listen, when I tell the stories of revival it makes me hungry Tommy Tinney used to say God has this incredible idea that church is all about him and when I talk about revival it makes me hungry for more of him when my little girl was small she's not small anymore when she was little I'd tell her a story once upon a time there were three bears mama bear papa and I'd tell the story and she'd say, every time, without fail, she'd say, do it again, daddy. Come on, y'all got kids. Do it again, daddy. It wasn't a story, it was being in daddy's 
Latin presence. And I'd tell it again, it gets shorter the second time. And she'd say, do it again, Daddy. Do it again, Daddy. And when I hear of how God used William Seymour, my prayer tonight is, do it again, Lord. Do it again, Lord. We want to hear it again. We want to, we want to be eyewitnesses to it. Do it again. We need you more than we've ever needed you. Do it again, Lord. Well, I was true to my commitment. I, I got five minutes before we pray. If someone's got a question about what we taught last week or Sunday morning or tonight, I'd like to maybe try to answer your question. Anybody got a question? You are so thoroughly confused. You have no questions. Going once, going twice. Come, Holy Spirit, I need thee. Come, sweet Spirit, I pray. Come in thy strength and Thy power come in thine own special way. Do you know that song? Stand with me, would you? Come. I sing between keys, brother. You find the key and I'll. Go ahead, start it. Oh, Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. I need thee. Do you need him tonight? Oh, come, sweet spirit, I pray. Yes, Lord. Oh, come in thy strength and thy power. Oh, come. Sunday morning people received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I don't know how many, several, several got refilling. If you're here tonight and you do not have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we'd like to pray for you to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We'd like for you to receive. There's some good people in this church that want to pray for you. If you're here, and we're not going to have to close our eyes and raise our hands, but if you're here and you don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit but you'd like to receive tonight, would you just come join me down here right now so we can pray for you? Is there someone that wants the baptism of the Holy Ghost tonight? Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. I believe when we lift up Jesus and talk about revival and hunger, I believe it releases something in the atmosphere. I believe there's something in this church tonight. And I'd like to pray for those that want to receive prayer. And when I say that, I, I say that that I hope everybody wants to receive prayer. I hope everybody wants more of God because I'm going to pray for you that the anointing of the Holy Ghost that was on William Seymour, that the anointing of the Holy Ghost that was at Azusa Street will be on you tonight. I want to pray for you. You say, well, that's going to take a long time. We're going to be here. No, no, no. Listen, I've been in meetings with thousands of people. I, 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 I don't have to... I prayed through this morning. I don't have to pray through tonight. I, I'll lay my hands on you and I'll speak over you and I'll, I'll pray for the next person. I'll, I'll, I believe that there's power 
through the laying on of hands and receiving from the Lord and I'd like to lay hands on you and pray for you tonight. Now, again, I, I, I said I, I, won't, I won't pray long prayers. I, I don't have a word for you. If you want a word, start in Genesis and go to Revelation. There's a word for everybody. But I want to pray for you, fresh anointing on your life, fresh anointing on your life. I want you to receive tonight. Now, people get afraid, I promise you. I will not push you down. If I push you down, you get up and push me down. That's fair enough. I will not. doesn't matter to me the position of your body. It's the condition of your heart. And you're going to receive something from the Lord tonight. If you would like to receive prayer before we go home tonight, if you'd like to have more of God, more of revival, more of the Holy Spirit, would you just come and fill this altar area down here so we can pray for you tonight? Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Oh, go ahead, Brother Michael, and sing it one more time. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Just come as a wisdom to children. Oh, come has new sight to the blind. Just come, Lord, and strength to my weakness. Take my soul, my body, and would you lift your hands to the Lord right now and say this out loud? Say, I believe I will receive a fresh anointing when hands are laid on me by faith in Jesus' name. Now, if you believe that, shout to the Lord with a voice of triumph. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Shoo, shoo. Now, just a couple of things I want to tell you. Just start worshiping the Lord. Your praise creates the atmosphere for God to move and habits the praise of his people. Just begin to praise him. While you're waiting to get prayed for, just begin to praise him. And I want to tell you one more thing. The longer you linger, the stronger it gets. The longer you linger, the stronger it gets. Don't act like you're a jack-in-the-box trying to get out of here. Just stay in his presence for a little while and let him touch you. All right. Worship him. Thank you. Won't you come? Yeah. Holy Spirit, I need thee. Oh, come, sweet Spirit, I pray. Oh, come in thy strength and thy power. Come in thine own gentle way. Come as a rest to the wind. Oh, come as a balm for the soul. Just come as a dew to my dryness. Fill me with joy.
come, Holy Spirit, I need Thee. Oh, won't You come, sweet Spirit, I pray. Oh, come in Thy strength and Just come, Holy Spirit, I need Thee. Just come, sweet Spirit, I pray. Oh, come in Thy strength.